Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Jacob's Well. If you guys want to stand up, we're going to begin worshiping together.
Amen. Well, welcome again, everybody. Thanks for coming out to worship with us at Jacob's Well. Um, I'm Katie. I'm here filling in for Mike, who's on sabbatical. I'm here with my friends Devin and Eric. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. We're really glad to see you. If you guys want to take a moment to greet those next to you, pass the peace, say hello.
As our call to worship today, I'm going to read from Psalm 86. None can compare to you among the gods, O Lord. Your exploits are incomparable. All the nations whom you created will come and worship you, O Lord. They will honor your name, for you are great and do amazing things. You alone are God. O Lord, teach me how you want me to live. Then I will obey your commands. Make me wholeheartedly committed to you. O Lord my God, I will give thanks with my whole heart. I will honor your name continually, for you will extend your great loyal love to me and deliver my life from the depths of Sheol. God, we invite your spirit to come and be with us as we give you praise this morning.
Please join me in this prayer as we begin our time of teaching. Guide us now, O Lord, by your word and Holy Spirit into this time of teaching, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You can have a seat. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you. Um, if you are new here, uh, this is not our normal altar piece. This is a cave. This last week, if you don't know, was VBS week, Vacation Bible School at Jacob's Well. And it was an extraordinary week. In fact, if you are involved in any way uh, at VBS this week, I actually cannot believe that you are here this morning. It was such an extraordinary week. And I don't know how anybody who served or volunteered or participated has any energy left. It was really a remarkable thing. This has become such an incredible part of our church's life. And I, I just, I kind of got to sit back a little bit and just watch it unfold this week. And one of the observations I would make about Vacation Bible School, which is ostensibly for little kids, you know, up to fifth grade grade to do. This is a ministry that is to our whole community, and it is like this leadership um like juggernaut, the, the number of people that are empowered across gifts and skills, the way that they involve kids in every aspect of it, the way that kids are leaders and leading each other, this incredible thing happens where at the beginning, everybody's kind of coming in and testing the waters. And by the end, this vibrant and life-giving community is just erupting around this place. And honestly, the church looks like a disaster zone by the end of, of, of five days of VBS. I actually can't believe it looks this nice this morning. It was crazy. But I just want to say thanks to all the folks that helped make that happen. It's incredible. There's actually so much happening right now on this Sunday. It's also Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to those of you who are fathers. Uh, after church at the 11, we've rescheduled our post-church cookout. So if you want to stick around or come back, we're going to have a grilling out on the outside of the church just here in the West parking lot. And then finally, the last thing that's going on today, certainly not at least, is our high school ministry is going on their annual trip to Colorado. Five vans full of high school students are going to be leaving from the cookout and going to Colorado for a week of fun and adventure and growing in faith and in community. So it's really going to be a fun day at the end of a fun week. I think maybe we will all collapse after today. But anyway, I'm excited to be here. I'm also excited for kind of a different reason. Um, at, on, on Pentecost, which was June 5th, we finished up a series we'd been doing called Living Jubilee, where we were studying uh, the book of Leviticus, particularly chapter 25, about God's plan for Jubilee and how creation is meant to be renewed and restored by regular seasons of rest and creativity. And it was really a super fun series to preach, pretty challenging to be honest. And I've been thinking, what should we do after that? What kind of series? And we're going to do something that we haven't done in a long time. We're actually not going to go into another series for a little bit of a season. We're just going to do Sunday by Sunday, just whatever's on whoever's speaking's heart. We're just going to preach week to week till probably early August. We think we have an idea for what we want to do in August. It's going to end up with a great party at the end of the summer. But until then, we're just doing week to week, which I'm really excited about because one of the things when you do a series, it's almost like you're preparing a multi-course meal. And every week when I would go in to prepare, I knew what the topic was. And so it's like going into a well-stocked pantry and saying, I need a little bit of this and needing a little bit of that. And then you start putting the ingredients together and start preparing. And you're thinking about many courses because it's going over several weeks. But this is more like, hey, I'm hungry. This tastes good right now. You know what I mean? It's kind of like a little bit more hand to mouth. And so this week, it was really fun because all week long, I was just praying, God, what should I talk about this week? God, what, what's, what's going on? What, what, what's interesting? What's, what, do you, what might you have to say? And I was actually just doing my own kind of devotional reading, and I was really stuck by a passage in Mark's gospel. So we're going we're gonna to read from Mark's gospel today. It's a passage I'm sure that once we get started, you'll be incredibly familiar with, but I was really arrested by some things that I read there this week. So the gospel reading today is from Mark chapter 6. Verses 30 to 44. Follow along as I read it off the screen. 
The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place to get some rest. That sounds really good. Jesus like, come on, let's spend some time together. Let's just relax for a little bit. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we going to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up the 12 basketfuls of broken bread, broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Now this is a very famous passage. Have you heard this passage before? Probably heard it preached on before. And it really stood out to to me today, but not for obvious reasons. Something different really arrested my attention uh, in this passage this week. And it was found in verse 34. I'm gonna go back and look at just verse 34. So Jesus has taken the disciples away to get some rest. The crowds are so hungry for Jesus, his ministry, that they're running along the shore following the boat so they can be sure to get there when he gets out, which I don't know how you would affect, how that would affect you, but when you're ready for a little vacation, a little break, then automatically running into people is not the best thing in the world. And yet Jesus has an interesting reaction. It said, when Jesus landed and saw the crowd that was large, he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. That's an interesting statement. Jesus sees their need. He doesn't see his own emptiness. He doesn't see the fatigue of the disciples. What he sees is a group of people who are in need. And then the response then, it says, is that he has compassion on them. Why? Because they are like sheep without a shepherd. And then this curious phrase. So he began teaching them many things. That's the thing that stood out to me. When I see people in need, the last thing that I often think they need is teaching. You know what I mean? It just seems like an odd response to people being in need. We can think of all kinds of things that people might need and that Jesus might respond with. But what Jesus does after having compassion on them is to begin to respond to them by teaching them. And Mark doesn't even say, hey, here's what's so important it was that Jesus had to say. He just summarizes what goes on by saying that Jesus was teaching them. So why might that be important? What might be going on? Well, maybe it's something like this. It seems like maybe their understanding of God and their understanding of their lives was disconnected. It might mean that their picture of what life with God is meant to be like and the reality of their own lives, they didn't match up. And so what's the problem that Jesus is addressing? Well, Mark tells us. He says that these people are like sheep without a shepherd. 
like sheep without a shepherd. So what are sheep like without a shepherd? Well, they wander around. They look for provision. And they're vulnerable to be preyed upon. And why is that a problem? Because that's not how sheep are meant to live. Sheep are meant to be shepherded. And one of the reasons why Jesus notes that they are like sheep without shepherd is fundamental to Israel's identity and God's identity. Why is that? Because one of the ways that God reveals who he is as their God is that God is a shepherd. God is a shepherd. We are all aware of Psalm 23, one of the most famous psalms in Israel's liturgical life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He prepares a place for me in the presence of my enemies. In those things, we see God guiding them. We see God providing for them. We see God protecting Israel. It's all there in Psalm 23. And as a result of God's identity as a shepherd God, Israel's leaders were meant to be shepherds as well. In fact, Israel's first king, Saul, was kind of almost the anti-shepherd. And it's not very long into Saul's reign as the monarch of Israel that we're told that God rejects Saul as king. Again, likely because he didn't mirror God's own heart for God's people. And it's an interesting story that then takes place in 1 Samuel 16, where God says to Nathan, the prophet that comes after Samuel, He says, go and find the new king that I will anoint. Go to Jesse, who's in the tribe of Benjamin. And he has many sons. And so Nathaniel, Nathan, he goes there thinking he knows. He lines up all the sons. And the biggest one and the most handsome one and the strongest one, he goes, this must be the king. And God says, no, I have rejected him. And he goes down the line and God keeps going, nope, 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 nope. And then he finally confused, he's exhausted the sons, says to Jesse, are these all the sons you have? And then Jesse goes, well, there is still the youngest. Jesse answered. And then listen to this. He is tending the sheep. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, I'm sorry, I said Nathan. Samuel says, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. And then when he walks in, Samuel looks at him and the Lord says to him, rise and anoint him. This is the one. God wanted over Israel a king who had God's own heart. And it's not surprising then that it is David who actually writes Psalm 23. Because he knew God as his own shepherd as well. Just a last note on this. In fact, in the prophetic indictments of Israel's leadership that come in the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, over and over and over again, the word of the Lord to the prophets against Israel is that Israel's leaders have not shepherded God's flock. So what do shepherds do if sheep wander around, if sheep look for provision, if sheep are largely unprotected? Shepherds guide, shepherds provide, and shepherds protect. So what does Jesus do? Jesus teaches them. Which, like I said, at first glance, you guys, it seems kind of curious. But when people are lost and in need of provision... And unsafe, it's true that teaching doesn't seem like the felt need, right? But maybe it is exactly what they need. Maybe there's more going on in their need than what they're immediately aware of. You see, every person, every community, every culture live within stories about what is going on in life. 
We live in narratives about who we are and what the world is like. And when our narratives are good and when they match reality, life can be full and satisfying. But when our narratives and reality are far apart, then we have a hard time making sense of what reality in our lives are supposed to be like. And so what Jesus perceives in the group of people they're talking to is a disconnect between the story they're living in and the reality that he has come to proclaim. And the challenge of this is because most of us, when we live in these stories, you guys, we absorb those stories unconsciously. It's what culture is. And we're not aware that we even are living in a story until a couple things happen. One, we go to another culture that has different stories. Has anybody ever done that? And all of a sudden you have what's called culture. It's not just people speaking a different language. It's not just different architecture or different landforms. It's because people are behaving in ways that are strange and alien to our sensibilities. Why? Because they're living in a different story about reality. And it takes time to reconcile the story that you thought you were in and a different story. It's why it's so confusing. So one of the things that can wake us up to our own story is actually going and participating in another story, right? Well, you know what else can do that? Teaching, especially the way Jesus taught. Because he taught by telling what? Stories. He took everyday normal objects that were people were used to seeing in one way and then telling them in a way that opened their imaginations to a reality that they weren't previously aware of. It's why I think the crowds are addicted to Jesus because when he speaks to them, life begins to line up. New possibilities begin to emerge. That's what I think is going on in this passage. You see, them being sheep and him being a shepherd, it's metaphorical, right? Jesus isn't really a shepherd and they're not really sheep. To be guided, to be protected, to be provided for, they need a better understanding of who their God is and what their God is like. They need a clearer perspective about who they are and what they really need. They need a better picture of what life with this God looks like and a better model of how this life can be accessed. So Jesus teaches them. He teaches them. Another way of saying it, you guys, is that Jesus is confronting a crisis of imagination. Jesus is confronting a crisis of imagination. And you know what? I see that same crisis of imagination at work in our world and in our lives and in our church today. And many of us are not aware that imagination has much to do with faith or church in the, in the first place. And that's a sign of the crisis that we don't see imagination as a vital aspect of what it means to follow our God. So what is imagination? If you had to describe or define what imagination is, how would you describe it? Give me a little feedback. What is imagination? Let's see how imaginative you are. Yeah, go ahead. That's imagination, yeah. Be, and and what, why do you point to that? Good, it was not reality to begin with. Somebody had an idea and, and, and fleshed it or made it real. Good, thank you. What else? What else is imagination? How, how would you define imagination? Thinking outside the box. So the metaphor there is that there's a certain prescribed box that we all live within. And every now and then we get outside the prescribed reality and we see new possibilities. Good, what else? I'm sorry? Creativity is part of imagination, yes. Any, any other final 
observations about what imagination is? Okay, here, here's, my, here's my technical definition of imagination. The faculty, the ability, or action of forming new ideas or images or concepts of external objects not present to our senses. So it's the ability to imagine or to externalize an object or an idea or a concept that's not immediately present to our senses. It's accessing a reality that does not yet exist to our sensory life. Now, you know what that sounds a lot like to me? What Jesus invites his disciples to do at the beginning of his ministry, to see an alternate reality. Mark earlier in his gospel at the beginning says it this way in Mark chapter one, verse 15. Read with me. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now he proclaims this, and this is an extraordinary thing. And we're so used to reading this and hearing this that we take it for granted. But we need to remember that Jesus is showing up in the scene in first century Israel and announcing God's kingdom and saying it's right here in front of you. And all the people are like, nah uh because it doesn't look like anything that they expect the kingdom to look like. They themselves are having a crisis of imagination. They're unable to see what God is up to because they've predetermined in advance what is possible and what it will look like when God shows up in their lives personally and collectively. And so they cannot see And so Jesus then says, two things are necessary for you to see this kingdom. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. You see, it was hard for people to understand what Jesus was talking about when he shows up and says, the time has finally come. The kingdom of God has come near. Why? Because they decided in advance, like I said, what God's kingdom would look like when it arrived. And he also had plenty of competing options that said, here's what it will look like when God's kingdom arrives. Another way of saying it might be that their kingdom's imagination had been domesticated. They'd had their imaginations domesticated. You know what it means to domesticate something? When you domesticate something, you take something wild and you teach it to live politely indoors. Right? How much does that sound like how we've engaged the gospel? We've taken something wild and domesticated it so that it lives politely and in a way that doesn't disturb us. Their imaginations for what God was, who God was, what God was up to, what was possible with God had been domesticated. They had God in a certain subscribed idea about what God could do. And Jesus is blowing that up. Their faith had been domesticated and Jesus is exploding all that. The kingdom of God has drawn near. Another way to understand what repent means, it means to wake up. And one of the things that Jesus' teaching does is it wakes people up. It wakes them up to who God is, what God is like, and what living in God's reality is supposed to be about. Jesus' teaching alerts them to the possibility where previously they had only been aware of problems. If you guys have been around for the last month or two, you know that I've been reading at certain points from the First Nations translation of the New Testament. I especially like the way that reading uh, translates Mark 1.15 here. The time has now come, he said to the people, creator's good road is right in front of you. It is time to return to the right ways of thinking and doing. Put your trust in the good story I am bringing to you. I love that. To repent and believe means to return to right ways of thinking and doing. 
wake up. And we see this happening in this passage. And you know who we see it happening with most profoundly, you guys? Not the crowd, the apostles. Jesus is discipling the disciples in this passage. I love how the story starts. Let's look at it again, verses 30 to 33. They're exhausted. They're gathered around Jesus. They've been out on a ministry assignment. There's so much going on that Jesus determines as a good leader what he needs to do is get his disciples away for some one-on-one time, some group kind of retreat action. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place to get some rest. That's not going to happen. So they went away by themselves in a boat to the solitary place. They've got to the retreat center, right? It's there, but when they get out of the boat, the crowd is waiting for them and they're there and we've already seen how Jesus responds to them. But then the disciples, noticing that Jesus is really going on the teaching thing and the sun's going down and their own stomachs are starting to growl. I honestly don't think they're caring about the crowd. I think they're caring about their own stomachs, if I were to be really honest. Then we're told in verses 35, It says this, by this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. You guys, this is an incredibly crucial moment at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. Why? Because Jesus is announcing that the kingdom has come near and he's trying to reconcile their lives and their images of God that have been divorced from one another in ways that are really significant. And then right in the middle of this teaching moment, there comes this opportunity where all of a sudden the disciples realize that the crowds are hungry. And you can't get more fundamental to living a way of life than what you eat and what you drink. And the disciples' answer to the problem of the crowd being hungry is what? Send them away. Go somewhere else for your most fundamental need, which is how most of us live our faith. We come to Jesus for a few good words, but then we get hit by some need in our lives and we've been taught that we gotta go somewhere else to get the real needs met. Send them away. Let them figure out this on their own. It makes sense, but Jesus isn't having it. What does he say to the disciples? Sarah, go ahead and put that right back up there. Back one slide. You give them something to eat. Now who's having a crisis of imagination? Right? Now the disciples are on the hook. And you can tell by their response, they do not have an imagination for the moment. Are you nuts, Jesus? This is half a year's wages worth of food sitting in front of us. They see a problem. Jesus sees possibility. Verse 38. How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. You guys, the disciples are getting some advanced coursework here. They're getting teaching with immediate applications. Their imaginations have been domesticated too. And for them, the kingdom is mostly still theoretical at this point. Send them away. And so we see the miracle here. And there's real debate in scholarship as to the nature of the miracle. Did Jesus multiply material matter? Did he take five loaves and, 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 uh, and, and two fish and just like miraculously duplicate Xerox supernaturally? It could have been that that's what happened. And some people think that he did that and other people think that what he did was he took the example of this child And then people, upon seeing this generosity, began to provide for each other out of what they themselves had brought. Now, I don't know what's more miraculous. Supernaturally reproducing food or getting a stingy, hungry group of 5,000 people to share with others. 
But regardless of what's going on in this passage, whether it's a supernatural reproduction of finite resources into infinite provision, or whether or not it's the spirit of the kingdom becomes infectious and people begin to share, I don't know, and it honestly doesn't really matter in this moment. What's, what's the opportunity here to see is what's going on between the disciples and Jesus. Because you guys, the disciples only see a problem and Jesus sees possibility. The disciples look out and see poverty and Jesus sees provisions. The disciples see people and Jesus sees persons with need. Which is why in another passage he will say, the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes and finds the one. Because Jesus sees persons in their need. He sees, yes, their poverty, but also provision. He does see problems, but he does not limit it in his imagination by that. He's unlimited because he faith, has faith in his father's good road. Have our imaginations been domesticated? Do we have a sense in our own lives, you guys, about what is possible with God in Christ? I mean, theoretically, we come to church and we sing these songs and we go, yeah, yeah, God can do all these things. But then functionally, in the lived existence of our lives, we live kind of like we've been sent away to go figure it out on our own living in our culture's stories about what's possible. Like the crowd. You know, I really, like I said at the beginning, loved preaching that Living Jubilee series. And on the last Sunday, we talked about creativity, commerce, and the church. And I was thinking about economics, and I was thinking about the economic aspect of this passage, because this is a passage about economics as well, isn't it? about provision and wages and, 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 and value and all those things. Nowhere have our imaginations been more domesticated than in our financial lives, right? No part of our collective life are we more like sheep without a shepherd than in our financial lives. We want guidance, we want provision, we want protection, we want security because we live in a world that conditions us to be afraid and tells us this financial world is just the world we live in. And the best you can hope for is to be generous. That, that, that's the best way. But you guys know, like one of the things that was so fun for those of you who are here to talk about what's possible and then to have my friend Kurt come up and tell the story about how they creatively did financial kind of good news in their neighborhood. Like I got choked up listening to Kurt tell his story. And when those of you who are here got to the end of it, you started applauding and Kurt was afraid of getting the attention to himself. And I think he misunderstood what we were clapping for. Not that Kurt and Emily and their family had done this thing, but for the possibility of good news breaking out in a world that tells us this is the way the world works, get over it and get in line. And all of a sudden we heard a story that goes, no, 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 no. There are new possibilities when we allow God's spirit to break into our lives and our stories and make us participants in the bringing of good news. Amen? It was so incredible. And then after the sermon, this incredible thing happened. I was standing right here and this man came up to me. He said his folks go to church here and he's only able to come a couple times a year. He's in his early 40s. And then he started crying. And he says, I work in financial services. And I've never had a vision for how my financial life could have an impact except to help Maple make more money. And he said, I heard a story today that gave me Faith that God might want me to do something more with my profession than just make people more money. And I was like, yes, the kingdom of God has drawn near, right? Yes, that's what I'm talking about. And it's not just there, you guys. It's in our relationships where we hit relational walls and we have exhausted our ability that we think there is about to be healed, to be reconciled, to be forgiven, to be restored. As far as we know, it's over. God says, no, there is possibility. It happens in our work lives. It happens in our neighborhoods. Where we see problems, Jesus says, no, your imagination has been domesticated. Wake up. 
believe the kingdom of God has drawn near. I don't know where it is this morning for you in your life, but I promise you that each one of us in a various place in our life are having a crisis of imagination where we see a problem and we're tempted to just leave it there and get sent away to be solved in some normal, conventional, unimaginative, bad news way. And Jesus says, no, I've come to reveal the God who raises people from the freaking dead. Do you believe? And the disciples had to say, well, it's gonna take us a little while. But Jesus, I'm confident that you're gonna stretch us and you're gonna keep bringing us back to these places again and again until we begin to trust and we begin like Peter to step out of the boat and try to walk on the water and even though we'll mess it up and start to sink, you're there. That's what it's about, you guys. Not getting it all figured out, but taking those tentative steps of faith wherever we find ourselves in crisis and trusting that there is provision, that God sees us as a person, not a problem, and that there's possibility in our lives where we imagined only death. Isn't that good news? Amen. Let's pray. God, thanks for the opportunity to be together this morning in worship. We thank you for the life that our community experienced this week in VBS. We thank you for the relationships that we have, and we thank you for the fact that you come and you break apart our stories about what's possible, that we might learn to depend not on ourselves, but instead depend on you. So Lord, we, we, we bring our crises to you this morning, whether they're relational, whether they're financial, whether they're work-related, whatever they are, and we ask you, Lord, to see them not with our own eyes, but with the eyes of faith, through the eyes of of your spirit alive and at work. Lord, we ask you to bring from death life. And so we come to your table this morning to be reminded of the pattern of your life, that you were taken and broken and blessed and given. Lord, may we also be taken and blessed, broken and given for each other and for the sake of the world. It's in your name and for your sake we pray, amen. You guys, before um, we go into the communion liturgy, I'm just gonna tell you that we're gonna do a couple things different this morning and I am so excited. One is if you are here this morning and there's something going on in your life where you're having a crisis of imagination, one of the ways that our faith grows is through prayer and having people pray with us. Our prayer team is here this morning and available to meet with you and to pray with you. And so just down the hall in our prayer chapel, if you go through the door here and go down the hall towards that bathroom back there, on the right-hand side, you'll see our prayer chapel. There are people in there that are wanting to pray with you. Uh, when you come and receive communion, you can go then out the back and go down there and have someone pray with you. That's the first thing. The second thing I am so excited to show you is that for the first time, and I don't know how long, we are actually having real bread for communion. I mean, you can't do a story about miracle loaves and fish and then not, so, so let me tell you what the options are because we know, and it's been a while since we've practiced this, here's what's gonna happen. Our communion servers are gonna be up here and we're gonna leave most of the elements on the table. What the communion servers are gonna do is they're gonna hold the cup. And so when you come up, if you don't feel safe and you still wanna do this, grab one of these. If you need gluten-free bread, then there's these wafers here. But if you feel safe and you want to, we're gonna invite you to take a piece of bread out of the tray and then we're gonna ask you, we practice intinction, which means we dip the bread into the cup. You do not submerge your fingers. <laughs> Agreed? You did, just dip the edge of the bread, pull it out, and you can either take it there or return to your seat with you. It's up to you, but our communion servers will be here to do that. Are we excited? I'm excited, praise God. We're doing real bread. All right, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us profess together who God has called us to be. We are a community of people following Jesus and learning to live in his ways. Let us remember the words that the Lord Jesus said on the night he was betrayed. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine. Amen. Let's come together to the table of Jesus.
If y'all wanna stand with us to sing the last year. join me now in this concluding prayer. Oh God, help us now to love as Christ loved, as this bread is Christ's body for us. Send us out in the world to be the body of Christ in the world and give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection when we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. Amen. We're just going to get a, a couple of announcements, but before I do that, I'm going to have Tyler come up and just give us a quick little summary of what happened this week with VBS. Yeah, so I'm Tyler Harnett. Um, Luke Cox and myself led the gathering that we had uh, for our youth uh, twice a day, and it was amazing. We had so much fun. Um, so do you want me to do the announcements, Tim? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So we have some uh, exciting men's events in the works. There will be a bonfire hangout next Saturday morning, June 25th at Oak Ridge Park in Shawnee. The plan is to gather around a fire, share some food and fellowship before an optional hike. So guys, if you're available. Also, next month on Saturday evening, July 23rd, there will be a men's astronomy expedition at the Powell Observatory in Lewisburg, Kansas. Sign up for that online if you are interested. And then today, don't forget about the grill out. 
Oh, there's also men's happy hour with Gilbert, Wednesdays at five. <laughs> and then today also, don't forget about the grill out. I'm sure that uh, lots of those dads like to grill. So come back at, after the 11 o'clock service for the grill out. Um, so I wanted to talk just a little bit about how amazing this week at VBS was. We had Cave Quest. So we got to spend time learning about the things that Jesus gives us, hope, courage, love, direction, power. And kids don't have a crisis of imagination. Kids have a crisis of having too much imagination, right? And so uh, what we were able to do and what our amazing leaders um, and art team and everyone who worked in any sort of thing this week, what we were able to do was plant a seed of that imagination, in that imagination, that God is as amazing as a cave, that God is bigger than the cave, that he is, you know, he makes you feel safe in a cave, all of these things, and, and the kids were able to see that. And so I, just, I wanna say thank you to everybody who volunteered um, and to plant that same seed of imagination that if you have any sort of awe at all in this, that, you know, 12 months from now we'll be doing it again. And there's been signups, you know, to volunteer. Lisa will come up here probably in, you know, next January or February or March and say, hey, come and volunteer. Now is the time to plant that seed and say, I want to be a part of that. And so to give you the full picture of how amazing this week was, they made a little slideshow. And again, it's just a drop and how amazing, wonderful God was and how his provision for all of these kids was through our church this week. So. Let me invite you to stand one more to receive our benediction. I do have to say that I was in here pretty often, and when I wasn't here, I was in my office, and I've heard that song so many times that this, mo this morning when I woke up at 1.30 in the morning, that was what I was hearing in my ear. Like, it will not go away. So thanks for bringing that back one more time. <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face to you and grant you his peace. Amen. Let's sing our benediction together.